Hey everybody! In this video I'm going to be practicing with black and white charcoal on toned paper. I really like this combination of toned paper plus black and white charcoal because you can create some like really beautiful texture and depth um, with sort of the image almost like blossoming out of the colored paper. Uh, so what I have here for tools um, I've got a regular eraser, I have a kneaded eraser, my white charcoal, and I just have a couple different weights of regular charcoal. So I've got um, a hard charcoal, kind of like an HB, I've got 4B, and then whatever soft is, it might be 6B, might be 2B. Sometimes they don't label them very well. <laughs> I also have a blending stump, um, an X-Acto knife if I want to use that to sharpen my charcoal, and then I also have a pencil sharpener. Word of the wise, I don't recommend using an electric pencil sharpener for charcoal pencils. It has a tendency to break off with the friction of it. Um, when you are sharpening a charcoal pencil, it's best to keep your fingers close to the entrance. That way you put less pressure on the charcoal pencil, making it less likely to break. Another technique you could do is to scrape your charcoal with a knife, kind of like whittle it down. Always cut away from yourself when you're doing this so you don't slice your hand. I know I learned that lesson when I was a little kid. <laughs> Don't want to do that. Um, using a knife to sharpen your charcoal will allow you to have a lot more charcoal showing. Um, so you can use it for shading a lot more easily without the wood of the casing getting in the way. The only downside to this method is it's a bit messy. Um, one other suggestion that I have with charcoal pencils, just kind of a housekeeping thing, um, try not to drop them. Generally, if a lot of stress happens to the charcoal pencil, you run the risk of the charcoal breaking inside of the casing and that is going to, in turn, just make it break every time you try and sharpen it, which is really frustrating. All right, let's get started. So I am drawing a skull because they're cool. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna start with white just because my paper is so dark. I think it's just gonna help my image kind of blossom out of the page a little bit more quickly at least. So I'm going to start with just kind of some medium light tones happening here. And as you're working with your shading, I think it's important to know kind of ahead of time what kind of aesthetic you're really aiming for. Are you trying to have really soft, smooth, blended marks? Do you want more of a hatched piece? Do you want more expressive marks? Um, I'm going to be aiming for more of a highly blended look on this piece at least. So I'm just going to kind of block in some of my values to start with. So I think this is a good start to my highlights. So I think at this point I'm going to start blending. With your blending stumps, um, you don't want to muddy up your values with any sort of graphite or charcoal that's left over on it. Um, you can easily clean this off with a piece of charcoal and just kind of scrape it off. Um, I have some clean areas, so I think that'll be fine for me. And what I'm going to do is just kind of start moving in a really tight circular motion using the whole side of my blending stump. I really only ever use the tip of my blending stump when I need to get into very small spaces. Otherwise it ends up kind of creating a line instead of 
a smooth blend, and that's not really something I'm aiming for here. Something to note as you are working on your blending is you might notice that the white gets just a little bit toned down after you blend it, so it's not quite as intense as when you first started, and you're going to notice this too when you in introduce the darks. Um, so after you blend, you're going to need to kind of go back and forth over it a few times with your charcoal just to build up your layers and start developing those values a little bit further. Um, so now that I have this kind of blended out, I'm just going to go in and start adding some more of my shadows and other um, areas throughout the piece. So I think I'm going to move to the back of the skull where it's a bit darker. So as you can see, the charcoal that I use the X-Acto knife to sharpen works really nicely when I'm holding my pencil in the sketch grip. I've got a really broad area of charcoal that's hitting the paper right now, so that keeps my mark nice and uh, soft. As I'm shading, I'm doing my best to not really draw lines. Instead, I'm really focusing on creating edges of value. So where does a dark edge meet a light edge? And that creates the semblance of a line instead of just drawing an actual line. And it's going to look a lot more realistic in the long run when you work that way. As I move into shade, I'm going to try and avoid using the parts where I use the white charcoal so that I don't accidentally get everything muddy. As we're building up value here, we can go in with our kneaded eraser and also use that to kind of bring out some of the lighter areas, or I guess more mid-tone areas on our piece. So you can kind of use it like a little stamp to pull out values. Um, and what I really appreciate about these is that they're moldable so that I can kind of shape them into whatever shape is going to work best for me for my given application. And with this stage, I'm really just going to be going back and forth a lot over my highlights and shadows just to start defining things more. Um, I'm probably going to do multiple layers over these areas to really ensure that I'm getting the correct values and the right textures and just starting to kind of build up the detail of the piece. Your kneaded eraser really is the best tool for this work. You can get so much texture and, and really just like bring out so many nice little surprises. What's also convenient with these erasers is the way that you clean them once they've kind of filled up is all you have to do is just stretch them out and rework it back into your eraser itself and then you have a clean eraser again. So not only is it therapeutic, it's almost like recycling. How convenient. It's helpful when you're shading to kind of follow the direction of the form. That's going to give you a better sense of volume than just random marks. This is not to say you can't use random marks, but if you're aiming for your stuff to appear realistic and appear to have a sense of volume, it's a good idea to try and follow the forms. And before I add my white into the eye sockets, I'm going to lift up some of this charcoal to bring it back to the original paper. And give myself a little bit more of a gradient so it's not as much of a harsh edge. There's a lot of subtle variation here between the highlights and the shadows, so I'm working really hard to just very lightly mix in some grays to create that mid-tone without making it too muddy. 
and I'm appreciating it's kind of giving it almost this painterly effect, which I think is working very nicely for the effect I'm aiming for. I think what I'm going to do is kind of speed up the rest of this first layer, and then we'll come back and talk about the second layer once I get to it. So at this point I have kind of gotten my values established on my skull and now it's time where I can go in and start creating more details throughout everything. So this is kind of like my first layer. I think a lot of people would be like, that looks done. But I really want to like try and get as realistic of texture as I can here. So I mean, I've been drawing for a few hours and I think I could put a few more hours into it and just really start amping up that texture. So a few sort of tips and tricks that we can uh, do as we're working here is one, if you are, you know, worried about smudging your artwork or, you know, getting your hand in the drawing at all, like especially if you're working on a bigger piece, it's much harder to avoid that. Um, what I recommend is that you just take a scrap piece of paper. Let me just clean that up there. And then just put that paper underneath your hand. That way your hand's going to rub against the scrap paper and not your drawing. That's going to keep your drawing safe and keep it from getting any unnecessary smudges in it. Another thing that might happen as you are working on your um, drawing is you might get to I don't know, for better or lack of a better word, uh, you might get to kind of a point of no return. So like you can't really add any more layers. Um, one thing that might be the reasoning for that would be what we call burnishing. So if you're like pressing really, really hard on your 
drawing and building up a really, really thick layer. You might notice your work getting kind of shiny in those areas or like very smooth down. Um, that's called burnishing. And generally that's kind of a point in which we can't do anything else to the drawing because it has smoothed the paper um, and you can't really add anything else over the top of it. Um, so generally you wanna try and avoid burnishing with graphite or charcoal, because um, that's where you really just can't do anything else anymore. You're stuck there. Um, so I try my hardest not to build up a really, really thick layer too fast, um, because that really limits what I can do later on. So preferably, I like to work in kind of lighter layers and just slowly build up my um, values and textures instead of just diving in and trying to do it all at once. Um, sometimes though, if you haven't like really thoroughly burnished your work, you can use a spray fixative. Um, so something like workable fixative, that's a really great tool um, for kind of gaining some tooth back into your drawing. So the tooth is the texture of the paper. Um, if you need to make it grippy again, if you will, um, spraying a couple layers of fixative over the top of your drawing can really help like fix the layers that you have so they don't move around at all. And then you can add more layers over the top of it a little more easily. So we use that fixative both during the process and at the end when we're all the way finished with our artwork as kind of like a final fixative so that your work doesn't smudge later. Another tool that we can use to blend with would be a paintbrush. So your paintbrush is going to give you a much softer blend than a blending stump. The blending stump is going to like very thoroughly make your marks go away, whereas the paintbrush is going to be a little more subtle. You might still see some of your marks there. Um, one of the biggest differences I note between the two is that um, with the paintbrush, it's substantially dustier. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind as you're working. You might have a little more puddle, puddles of dust. Um, but as you can see, like you can still kind of see the marks that I created. They're just softer and subtler. So the paintbrush is going to be kind of a good intermediate tool to work with. Your blending stump is going to be a bit more aggressive and also allow you to get into smaller spaces. So I like to use the paintbrush as I'm building up my layers because I want to start keeping some of the texture that I'm creating with my charcoal. The only downside to using the paintbrush is it doesn't quite have the same control as the blending stump does. So your edges are not going to be nearly as crisp. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind as you're probably going to have to go back in and refine some edges after working with your paintbrush. But it does create some really lovely like soft dustings of value. So now that I have these kind of blended out a little bit, I'm going to have to go in and clean up my edges more to ensure that I have my crisp lines back where I want them. Because like I said, it gets a little fuzzy using the paintbrush. All right, from here, I think I'm just going to speed things up again and keep building up my values.
So I'm just going to go ahead and do some final little cleanups. I've been drawing on this for, I don't know, probably like four hours now. And I don't want this video to be, you know, an epic length feature film here. So <laughs> uh, I think we'll leave it at this and, you know, be happy where it's at. I will probably keep adding on to it later, but... Um, I think this is a good example of the way that you can use black and white charcoal to build up really realistic values on toned paper. So hopefully you can take a few things from this video and apply them into your own work. Thanks for watching and keep creating.